So what's DNA? DNA is made of five atoms, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and hydrogen. These five elements form the sugars, the phosphates, and the nucleotides that are contained in the DNA double helix. The sugar and the phosphate forms the backbone of the helix, and the nucleotides are in the middle. They kind of look like rungs of a ladder. There's only four different nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. The nucleotides form complementary pairs in the DNA double helix. A, or adenine, is always opposite to T, thymine. C, cytosine, is always opposite G, guanine. If you take the DNA double helix and you split between the different nucleotides down the middle, you actually get complementary base pairs. So you can have one side of the strand, take the DNA nucleotide sequences from that, and you'll know what the opposite DNA strand codes for as well. A single long strand of DNA comprises a chromosome. The chromosomes condense during mitosis and meiosis, and you can actually see the chromosomes under a microscope while this is occurring. So what's a gene? A gene is simply a sequence of nucleotides in the DNA double helix. It might code for a protein, or it might have a different function in the genome, such as a regulatory element. A gene has a consistent location on the chromosome for individuals of the same species. This is called a locus. If you have variant copies of a gene, these are called alleles. So for example, everybody has eyes. We have genes that code for colors of eyes, but one person has brown eyes and one person has blue eyes. These are examples of alleles or differences between populations that are encoded by genes. A gene is considered a basic unit of heredity because it codes for a protein. So what's a microsatellite? A microsatellite is like a gene, only it doesn't code for a protein in most cases. A microsatellite is a string of nucleotides that are repeated numerous times in the DNA code. For example, CA, 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 CA. That's a microsatellite. The number of repeats can vary between individuals of the same species. As with the gene, when different individuals of the same species have different versions of a microsatellite, these are called alleles. However, unlike genes, microsatellites do not usually code for proteins, which means that they do not influence the characteristics of an organism. If a microsatellite does not code for a protein, a mutated allele is more likely to be retained in the population because it's not under selective pressure. Another way of saying this is that mutations in genes that code for proteins are usually harmful. And because they're harmful to the individual, that individual is selected against in the population. And they typically don't survive to reproduce and pass their genetic material on to the next generation. But if you have a microsatellite mutation, which doesn't influence the fitness of an individual, that mutation can stay in the population because that individual is not being selected against. Because of that, you can end up with a lot of different mutated microsatellite alleles in the population. And that's what population geneticists take advantage of, those mutated microsatellite alleles. Thus, microsatellite mutations survive in populations, and alleles of microsatellites can be much more variable than alleles of genes. A microsatellite mutation might be an increase in length of the repeat number of base pairs or a decrease in length of the repeat number of base pairs. In a single species, the number of alleles will increase as the number of mutations in the population accumulates. Microsatellites are useful for genetic analyses. For example, they can be used to identify individual people. This is very helpful in criminal cases in cases of paternity, and also in population genetic studies. Moving on to salmon population genetics. How do we use these differences for genetic research? Microsatellites can be used to determine whether a salmon that's caught by a fisherman comes from a particular river where that population is dangerously low. Therefore, we can use information from microsatellites for adaptive fisheries management in near real time. So what's so amazing about salmon migration is that when the adults come back, they come back to the same river where they were born. 
the same river that their grandparents bred in, their parents, and that their offspring will also return to. And it's because the salmon come back to that same river that they have a unique genetic population. So each river has its own kind of unique genetic signature. To identify a fish from a particular river, we've identified microsatellite signatures from rivers all across the Pacific Northwest. We've genotyped hundreds of rivers and thousands and thousands of individuals. We've developed this standardized DNA microsatellite baseline, and then we match the signature of a fish that's pulled from the ocean and compare it to the baseline population. And that is how we can assess where a fish has originated from or in other words, the river of origin.